Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our um, Welcome to Editing 101, Setting Yourself Up for Success class that we're having here as a part of the 48-hour film festival that's being put on here at the Rawlings, or actually at the Pueblo City County Library District. Um, this class is uh, to prepare you for our 48-hour film festival. The thematic elements are going to be dropping this Friday night at 6.30, um, so watch the uh, 48 Hour Film Festival Facebook page for that. Um, but without any further ado, I'd like to present our presenter tonight. His name is Adrian Montgomery. Uh, he's a local freelance videographer and editor here in Colorado. Um, he just got finished uh, creating and producing an hour long documentary about the US immigration system. And he's also previously participated in some 48 hour film festivals before. Um, so he's got some really good tips and tricks and things to do and things not to do for you guys to share tonight. Um, so without any further ado, I will let Adrian take the stage and he can let you know what's going on. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we'll get off and rolling. Here we are. All right. All right. So thank you, uh, everyone, for being here tonight. So yeah, so tonight we'll be talking about editing 101. So my focus is going to be setting yourself up for success. So let's see. Tonight we'll be talking. I'll just be giving you just a brief uh, synopsis about myself. Then I'll start moving into talking about the role of the editor. Uh, then pre-production's impact on the on editing. Uh, then some suggestions. Uh, then move into kind of some some suggestions for everybody. You know what to collect before you sit down to actually edit. Uh, and then I'll go over some brief suggestions for an editing workflow. And then I was going to open up two uh, projects I have in Adobe Premiere, which is the editing software package that I use, um, and just kind of show you how I've got some some things organized and um, have a discussion. So it. I will be trying to stop periodically and remember to ask for questions or look and see what's in the chat window. Um, so please uh, feel free to drop in questions and we'll answer them as the as we progress. So, okay, apologies, here we go. So my background, so I am the, um, in the film world, uh, I've been working on the uh, Seeking Solutions uh, documentary uh, with Polly Washburn, who, if any of you were here uh, for the presentation last week, uh, she's my, uh, we've been working on that together, so partners in life and creative projects. Uh, so we interviewed nine people about the American immigration system, and then from those interviews, we've created an hour-long doc documentary, and we've included infographics and some other, you know, voiceover work in that. That's, you know, so close to being finished, it, it, it's painful. I'm almost done working on the subtitles at the moment. So other things I've done, uh, back in 2016, worked on the 48-hour film project. I was the director of photography and an assistant editor on, on that project. And uh, I've been a, a freelance videographer and editor for the past several years. So moving on, I will try and share a little bit of what I know with you. So just to reiterate, um, a film is made three times. So you, there's kind of three phases, the pre-production, the production, and the post-production. Pre-production is when all the planning happens, finding uh, cast and crew and locations and all that upfront work. Production is the is what you think of as making the movie where you people are on set with their cameras and audio gear and the lights and um, actually, you know, filming the 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 uh, video and then the post-production work is where it all comes together and you and then the very final piece of that of course is uh, uh finding distribution for your for your film so tonight we're going to be talking about post-production because that's where editing falls and a little bit of course as i mentioned about how the what comes before that impacts what we're doing but really um staying focused on the post-production side of things tonight so what is the editor's role? This seems like a good, a logical place to start our discussion. So first and foremost, it's the editor's job to bring the vision of the film to life. And by that, I mean, people have, all of this work has been up to this point, and it's up to the editor to take all the various pieces of footage that have been shot, the music that's been found, put it all together, and actually turn it into the movie that everybody's been making for 
probably quite some time by the time the editor sits down uh, to do their job. And of course, in the 48 hour film uh, world, you've been working on it for a couple, you know, a day or so, and you've <laughs> you got to got to bring it to life. So other things the editor is doing is determining pacing of the film by that i mean if somebody says oh we want this to be a nice slow scene or this is a really fast scene well just how fast is it just how slow is it how much time is there between one one uh person speaking and the next person speaking all of that's really up to the edit editor's choice um other things you have to do being a little cynical uh, one of the editor's roles is to fix all the mistakes made previously or cover them up and somehow make it just work beautifully. And lastly, and this is, I would say this is probably the most important thing the editor does is bring fresh eyes to the project. Uh, kind of the, this last, you know, you, everybody's been, you know, the director and the producer have been talking for a, a while about this movie. The editor sits down kind of fresh and may have some opinions about things. And this may include dropping material that doesn't move the story forward that's your most important job as the editor is to move the story forward and even if it's the hardest scene that they spend hours working on and everybody's exhausted and we're so excited about how it looks but it doesn't move the the, the story forward it doesn't fit it's your job to tell people that and to you know remove it from the from the uh the final product um and let's see, moving on. So if that's the editor's job, how does pre-production impact editing? So first off, what happens in pre-production? The script is written, things like the size of the cast and crew are determined. There are a number of creative choices, either aesthetical or practical choices that are made. Um, things like, you know, probably for the 48 hour film project, things like the deliver, the resolution frame rate you're supposed to be delivering at may, may already be set. Uh, but things like, do you shoot the scene indoors or do you shoot that scene outdoors or, you know, how many people are speaking at once? This is all choices that are made up front. Um, really, this is where the vision of the film is developed. Um, and as I said previously, it's the editor's job to actualize this vision while honoring the creative choices and wishes uh, that were previously made. So with that in mind, pre-production brings a lot of information, a lot of decisions. So what do you need to know before you can actually start editing? And this is where the this is where I want to just take a moment and say, it really, really pays off in editing to stop for a moment and before you start working to start planning out what you're gonna do. That actually makes things go much faster. So talking about that, you need a copy of the script. If there's a storyboard, you need a copy of the storyboard. That is a fantastic communication tool. And in, in a little bit, I will actually show you how I've used the storyboard in the past uh, to help drive my editing. You need a shot list. You know, what are you expecting? What shots are you expecting to get from the film crew? Uh, is there any music that needs to be added to the to the um, the finished product? If so, is it ready yet? Um, you know, have, has that decision been made? Has somebody written it? All those those kinds of questions. Good to answer. Are there any sound effects? And by sound effects, I mean something like ominous footsteps from uh, off screen. You know, th these kinds of things, or somebody snapping their fingers and the, it just didn't come, it's probably not going to come through okay uh, on the film, you know, on the microphones that are picking up people's voices. So maybe it's better to actually have a pre recorded snap that you're using. Some these kinds of things. Uh, Lookup tables, this is part of color grading. Again, if somebody's figured out a, vis a visual aesthetic that they want for the whole film, you can, they may have selected a, a lookup table that, that cre helps create that. So that's kind of advanced, but if, they, if that's available up front, great. Uh, if there are any other visual assets that you need, uh, again, uh, collect them. Another great thing to have up front, a list of the cast, the crew, any thank yous you need to give or recognitions, these kinds of things. Because um, you can start building the credits, excuse me, you can start building the credits immediately. As soon as you have that, you don't, you don't need any film. You can just start building that whenever you want. Also, logos, or are there any other artworks that needs to be included, either at the beginning or the end? Uh, again, as soon as you can get those, the better. And 
I would also say, obviously, the first thing to do, once you get all of these pieces, these bits and pieces of information, create your project in whatever software package you're using and import all this footage and then start to get it organized. Um, jumping ahead of myself a little bit, but that's just want to say that anything you can do before you sit down to edit is better. Um, these. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, okay. So other things. Once production gets started, there is a bunch of inf you will then be getting a bunch of information from various crews. So the first thing that you would really want to get is any production notes that there are. Uh, people might call this a shot log. So it'll tell you things like um, all the good takes that happen, all the bad takes that, are, that happened and that you can just ignore. Um, somebody might mention that, oh my God, this scene, we had the most perfect take, but uh, you know, there was this giant noise from off screen that had nothing to do with it. You know, a truck backing up or an airplane flying overhead. Can you fix it, editor? And the answer to that is in 48 hours, probably not, but you know, maybe. Uh, also, as footage becomes available, uh, you want to collect that and organize it. And this is actually something that you need to determine ahead of time is how and when are you actually going to get the footage from the camera crew? For example, are you expected to show up on, on set and be there the whole time through the shoot so that you can be collecting uh, footage and um, saving it off to a hard drive uh, because there's no... That, that work of collecting the footage and then making copies of it, that's usually done by something called a data wrangler. If the crew is big enough to have something like that. Um, if not, that's probably falls on the, on the shoulders of the editor. So, you know, important thing to communicate with the rest of the crew, when, when and where are you getting the footage from? Also, um, if there are external audio recordings, um, again, how are you gonna get them? But again, this depends on if audio is actually being recorded separately or not. If everything's being done in camera, then you don't have to worry about that. Your life's uh, significantly easier. <clears throat> A little bit of a delay on my changing slides. <laughs> okay, here we go. So now that you've got everything and you've gotten the, some foot some or all of the footage and all you've done all this work ahead of time what do i suggest you do how do i suggest you actually organize your workflow so the very very first thing to do is what's called bin your footage or basically which means organize it into some sort of folder structure in your within your project um, and do this in some sort of meaningful way and if you get the script early enough, you know what's how many scenes there are, you know how many acts there are, all these kinds of things. You could actually build your bins off of the scenes. Um, you know, scene one, scene two, scene three. I do that all ahead of time. So as the as the crew is shooting a scene, if you get the footage for scene five, you just put it into that bin and you're ready to go. Um, also, if there's more than one editor, uh, decide how to split up the various tasks of editing. And what I would say, this is this is probably if this is the one thing you walk away from, this is this is probably a great one to walk away with. Review all of your footage before you do any editing. You want to make sure you understand all the good takes, all the bad takes, um, what all the different bits and pieces of footage you have received are. Is there B-roll? Is there just, and by B-roll, I mean something that's not specifically in the script. You know, maybe there's just a picture of one of your, um, one of the characters just staring out a window for 30 seconds. And that's actually critical for something um, later. So, or just something that you can add into a scene to kind of, again, as I was talking about pacing, maybe slow things down a little bit. So, um, you need to, as you are reviewing your footage, what scenes do you have? And then, very critical, is something missing? The crew comes up to you and said, yep, we're done shooting. And you say, I've got this scene. I, I don't have the footage for it yet. Let them know that immediately. Uh, so that they, because maybe you're the person who's caught, they forgot to shoot a scene. Or maybe um, they just forgot to give you the footage for it. And you better get it from the camera crew before they delete their memory cards. 
So what else can we do? Okay, so once you get to that point, now you're ready to actually start cutting. And I would suggest that you're, what, what, what is called your rough cut. So this is basically the very first assembly of all, of all the footage. I highly recommend that you follow the script as close as possible for this first cut. Everybody should look at it as, as the, as the um, script describes. And as I said, a movie is made three times. Uh, this is the third time. So at this point, you can start making the decisions about maybe this fits, maybe this doesn't fit. But anyways, you show this rough cut to selected people. I'm going to suggest something like the director and the producer um, and have a discussion. Get some feedback about what, what works, what doesn't work. Tell them, hey, I don't think this scene works. I think this scene works great. This scene works great, but I really want to speed it up or I really want to slow it down in terms of pacing and just have those discussions. Then you're going to go back to your editing machine you're going to prioritize your remaining tasks in terms of importance and by what I, by that i mean if i don't do the things first that if you don't do them the whole movie fails so do that first and then there if there's something like hey it would be really great if you could just you know make this small change here but it doesn't really make any difference save that for last so that's up to you to, to organize but start with what's most important first um, so in terms of what to do, in terms of that, make changes first. So you, you've had this meeting, you've kind of prioritized all the feedback, start making those changes and watch your time. Um, the, the 48 hour film project I worked on, um, we, uh, there were three of us editing and we kind of each took a, a handful of scenes and edited them together and then handed all of those edits to one person who put them into the main timeline. Uh, and we looked at it, made some changes, and then we actually had to do the final render. So we're actually, you know, the computer's actually creating the, the MOV file or whatever you're gonna turn in. Uh, we were rendering that as we were driving to the, uh, to, to the drop-off place. So thankfully we're doing this work on a laptop that had enough um, you know, CPU in it to be able to actually render this out in the time it took us to drive to the, this lo the drop-off location. So watch your time. Um, along those lines, there's two things you can do, kind of color correction and uh, sound mixing at the end. Color correction kind of means two things. One, bringing all of your, uh, your camera crew has worked very hard, but somebody at some point underexposed something. So you have these nice, nicely lit scenes and then one of them super dark, you know, fixing that kind of stuff, bringing everything up to like a common level, fixing any white balance differences, if you have time to do that. Um, and then there's other things you can do, which is gets into what's called color grading, where you're creating an, an aesthetic, um, creating like, emphasizing the blues in this scene and emphasizing the warm colors in the other scene something like that. Um, sound mix, sound is incredibly important to the success of your um, of your video because if people can't understand what they're hearing, they will just turn it off. So getting good sound is extremely important. If you have time at the end, um, so I guess the point there is when you're actually recording sound and you're shooting your video, do the get the best sound quality that you can so you have the least amount of work to do in post. And really, in the, in the timeline you're going to have with the 48-hour film project, you're not going to have time to do much more than bring everything to a kind of a col uh, common uh, gain level or volume. And um, probably um, if there is some background noise, you might be able to have some time to fix the worst of it, depending on what uh, editing software you're using. Uh, so then after that, Everybody looks at it one last time. You go, yep, this is this is what we wanted, and it's time to export the film so that we can get it. You know, make that that final delivery time. So hit the export button uh, and pat yourselves on the back for a, a job well done, and turn it in. So where are we going from here? <laughs> there we go. So let's look at a real project. So I'm going to go ahead and get out of my PowerPoint presentation here. And let's see here. I'm going to go over one button. We're going to go to Premiere Pro. So 
Editing software. This is what I use for my editing. This is Adobe's Premiere Pro. Um, there's a lot of, it's like if you have access to this or like Final Cut Pro, fantastic, feel free to use it. Um, if you have, if you're looking for something that's um, cheaper, uh, there is like iMovie that comes with any, pretty much any Apple computer is a, is a good bet. It probably can do everything you need it to for just put assembling footage and making simple edits. Um, other pieces of software, if you're looking for something a little bit more advanced than that, uh, I've used DaVinci Resolve, which is another editing uh, tool. Uh, there's a paid version, a free version. The free version does everything you need it to and more. So you can just download that for free and, and edit with it. I do recommend uh, that if you're not if you're not a, a seasoned editor, make sure you understand how to use your software a little bit before you start. Maybe just shooting like thirty seconds of film or a couple minutes of film, and just making sure you understand how to do the basics of cutting and um, moving footage around on your timeline before you sit down to actually edit uh, with a with a big time pressure. So one of the things I was talking about. Um, what I'm going to try and talk about now, uh, it doesn't matter what tool you're using. Uh, all, all software packages have something like this built into them. So I'm going to start with how I actually organize my project since I was stressing um, making sure that everything is nice and neat. So this is a basic format that I use for every project I, I've ever worked on. And it's very flexible, um, but it's also very simple. So. I created a couple of, remember I said the word bins are really their folders. So here's some folders, each that I have named um, to do different, to hold different ki kinds of assets. So for one, I have audio. So I had, um, I should back up, I apologize. What I'm showing here is actually a little video I did for fun with myself, uh, with, um, on a weekend, but, you know, I had a little bit of help. Um, from from Polly on this one, but mostly what it was is it was uh, I played the saxophone. My saxophone teacher was trying to have a recital, but obviously uh, re things like recitals aren't aren't very feasible right now. So we did a virtual recital where everybody just filmed themselves playing their saxophone and sent it in. So I of course couldn't resist having some fun. So there's um, some backing tracks, which is basically just uh, some music that was laid down that I was kind of accompanying me playing my saxophone. Uh, and then I have another bin. So this was kind of the, the pre-recorded materials that I brought in. Uh, and then these are all the recordings I made of myself uh, playing the saxophone, do the various takes and all those kinds of things. And I have them sort of had them or organized and then I kind of uh, split out some other pieces. So all of that's a little bit more detail than you need, but it's nicely organized. I know where everything is. And these are, these are uh, clearly labeled. Then the next, the next um, type of bin I always create is something that I always call footage. So I have it broken down into scenes. Uh, basically, I have you know, four scenes in this, in this little recording of myself, if you will. Um, a beginning, middle, end, and then some solos that were in there. So again, all the footage that was in there, and then I broke out some other short pieces that I actually wanted to use. But again, it's all in this bin. It's clearly labeled. And if this was, say, a scripted event, or a scripted, excuse me, a scripted film, this could be scene one, this could be scene four, this could be scene three, this could be scene two. However, whatever makes the most sense and is relevant to, to the project you're working on. Uh, moving on, I always create this other bin because there's always a few things that need to get organized that I just don't know where else to put them. So in this case, I have a picture. Uh, I just created some black video because I needed it for a couple of places. And I just put all those things in here. So again, so that they're organized and I can find them later. Uh, and then there's the sequences. So in Premiere Pro, you're going to create what's called timelines. And this is where you do all your editing. Those are called sequences. And again, I create a folder with all of these sequences in them. And the, sorry, and this is where, this folder is where I keep all of my sequences so that they are neatly organized and again, easy to find. And I try and label them and name them 
in ways that make sense. So it might be rough cut would be one or, or director's cut would be the next one, or this is scene four and scene five, you know, whatever you need to do to name them so that it makes sense to you. So that's, that's how I've organized this very simple little project. Uh, so let's take a look at the timeline real quick. Um, here we go. So expand all tracks. So here we go. So sorry, this is a complete, this is kind of an overwhelming view. It makes perfect sense to me because I've looked at it and I'm so acquainted with it. But again, when it comes down to organizing yourself, I highly recommend, um, especially, okay, it's probably a little bit less important for fiction films, but uh, I still think it might be a good idea. Um, I kind of have like my scenes or um, my views on different layers. And maybe if you have two cameras going, it'd be a really good idea to have your A camera on one layer, your B camera on another layer. Um, but more importantly, what I actually want to show you is how I've used the storyboard to help organize my editing. And that's really the point of this. So let me come out of here. And when we look at the storyboard, I actually have, I actually have the storyboard I can show you. And again, nicely neat in my other assets. So let's take a look at this. Now, it's of course upside down and backwards because I drew it out by hand and then I scanned it in and for some reason the scanner brought it in upside down. So it's a little hard to read and I have terrible handwriting which doesn't help either. But the pictures are what matter. Um, and it doesn't have to be a work of art. It just has to be able to communicate what's supposed to be happening on screen. So you can see that I'm visualizing two people on screen, one person's playing, and I also have, again, this is kind of important, uh, one person's wearing a hat, the other person isn't. Uh, and then, so with that, let me jump back to how this actually fit in on the timeline. Hmm, let's see here. So on the timeline, um, I've got my storyboard laid down as, as one of my layers. So that, as I said, as I was laying down these other tracks, I knew where to put them on my time, on my storyboard. And I actually had the storyboard timed out to my audio, to my, my takes, if you will, of all the, the various bits and pieces I was uh, playing. So when we look at the screen, we can see there's two people on screen. Okay, so if I look at what I actually laid down, um, there are two people on screen. And you notice one person's wearing a hat. And if we go back to the storyboard, one person's wearing a hat. So this is just an example of the camera crew knows exactly what's happening. I was the camera crew, but doesn't matter. If there had been a camera crew, they would have known exactly what is supposed to be happening on screen. The editor can see this and go, oh, okay, I understand what's what I'm supposed to be, what, what this is supposed to look like. And that's a pretty easy thing to put together. Um, then as things move on, there's another scene. Ah, well, look, one the other person is playing and the other person is supposed to be looking at them is kind of what this tells, tells us. And if we look at this, then there you go. And if I just scroll around a little bit, you can see exactly what's captured on the storyboard is what's happening on the screen. And if we just move down the timeline a little bit, ah, here we go. This is, this is another interesting thing. So there's a new scene. This is a solo. I only want one person on screen. So when I sit down and look at the footage, I understand you know, how this fits together. And magically, I've got exactly that on the screen. So, and you can just keep going um, through the storyboard. And this is high. Ah, that does move good. OK. And I can see here, wait, there's two people facing each other. How did I know that I want to have um, two copies of myself kind of staring at each other? Well, the way I did that was I looked at the storyboard, and that's what the storyboard described for this portion of, of the video. So, and then the final piece um, was something that says, uh, you know, something about a really blown out silhouette of somebody playing their last few lines. And if we look, that's exactly what's on screen. So with that, uh, I've realized I've been talking a lot longer than I meant to without stopping for questions. So Sharon, are there any questions that I need that I can answer that you've noticed so far? None, 
None that have come up yet. I'm okay. still monitoring. Um, as generally happens with these types of things, it'll probably be tomorrow. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> but that, that just happens. Okay. But no, awesome. No, just keep on going. I don't want to interrupt Fantastic. Your okay, so we've looked at a fairly simple project here. Uh, where I've, and I hopefully impress upon you how, how the, the, um, the storyboard can be a very useful tool for understanding the visual aspect and kind of the flow of how everything's happening. And then I use it as a, a tool for driving, in this case, for driving kind of the timing of all my uh, cuts and who's on, you know, who's on screen, who's not. All of that came from the storyboard because, um, well, also because the storyboard was really the script at the same time, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, is there anything else I really wanted to say? Ah, yes. And of course, just to review, I the, I had carefully planned out ahead of time, you know, what music I wanted in and where how it fit into the timeline. Again, driven by the, by the storyboard. So, with that, let's look at a more complicated project. So I said I'd been working on a documentary. So this uh, here we go. This is. Um, the actual project, well, it, it's a copy of the project I've been working on the documentary in. So I've been working on this for two years. Now, no, I've not been working on this project uh, 40 hours a week for two years. That It's been evenings and weekends. But that actually even more makes organization even more important so I can find things two weeks later when I come back to look at it again. Um, and also, over two years, things can get kind of messy. So this is a very similar structure to what I was describing. I've got my footage. I've got um, some external assets. I've got um, some external audio files that I brought in. So in this case, we had to do some voiceover. So I had a script that where I had voiceover one, voiceover two, voiceover three. So all of the takes for this voiceover were in that bin. Again, trying to make it as easy as possible to find. Uh, and I broke it up. Uh, by takes, and I'll show you how I do that uh, when, in just a minute. But that is the voiceover rendered cuts. Okay, so rendered cuts. This is something I didn't mention before. I actually find it pretty important to have a folder uh, that any anything I render out, I put in here um, so that I can find it later. So what what was the name of that movie that I delivered? You know, what was the name of the final cut? Well, it's in here somewhere so I can find it. So you can see we've had a couple trailers. So those are in here and for my reference and I can, again, making it easy to find. Uh, and then sequences. I have a lot of sequences for this because we went through one, two, three, four, five, six, what we were calling rough cuts. So six very early cuts had a screening, got a bunch of feedback. All the, the cuts after that screening are in here. Um, so again, keeping it organized so that I can find things later. Now, on a 48-hour film project time frame, you the same thing applies. You don't want to be spending 10 minutes looking for something because that's 10 minutes you can't be editing uh, and now you're you're just gotten that much closer to your deadline without actually accomplishing anything. So keep things organized so that you can just go to, I need the graphics or I need the voiceover for this for scene eight, and this is this is the, oh hey look I even marked it as good, I want this one and off you go. Um, let me think what else did I want to mention in here in terms of footage? So same thing with footage. Um, so these are all the people we interviewed. You can see the date. Um, and same thing, I, I have a similar structure inside of these that again, if I had any external audio recordings, they are in here. And there's, here is the foot, the, um, this is the actual interview. So that's the interview right there. If I need to refer back to it for any reason, there it is, I can find it easily. Um, I think that's probably what I need to say here. So in terms of uh, organizing a, um, a more complicated piece like this. So 
Again, I have lots and lots of tracks here, as you can see. Basically, I have a track for every speaker. So whenever this speaker shows up, they're always on, let's see here. Whenever Ravi shows up, he is on this track. So that uh, that's, again, it just makes it easier for me to jump back and forth between um, times he's on screen, whatever, whatever I need to do to Ravi, I can just do this one um, track and, and I'm, I'm in good shape. So the other thing I did is I created layers for other things. So there's this graphics layer. So for example, uh, if we go see what we're on screen, this is our, our opening sequence. So I just put it on that, that, um, that graphics, um, um, track. And, and there it is. Again, it makes it a little bit easier, especially if I compress everything. So minimize all tracks. I know that that this is where all of my graphics are. And then other things I, that shows up regularly, the lower thirds. So lower third, you probably won't have to deal with in a um, fiction film. But basically, if you're ever watching the news, something slides in and it's got some text on it that gives the speaker's name and their job title or something. That's a lower third. So these show up regularly in documentaries, so I just created a track for them. So again, these are not necessarily what you're going to have to do in the 48-hour film project, but um, it's organized in a way that's relevant to the project I'm working on. So just keep that in mind when you're working on things. And the other thing I did, so here's all my video tracks and all the audio accompanying audio tracks are down here, and they are named exactly the same. So if I want to find the audio that goes with um, Ravi, let's say, for example, I think he's on nine. Uh, there it is. And here's Ravi's video track. So again, just keeping that everything organized together so that I can just keep track of everything um, and keep things, as I've, I've been saying, organized so you can move quickly between them so you can spend your time editing, not looking for things in your project. Uh, and I think that is about what I was hoping to uh, cover. So uh, if any other questions have shown up, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Oh, uh, if not, I've got something else I can show real quick. Yep. No more questions? Okay. No more questions. Few people watching. All right. So as it says, uh, I'm happy to answer questions about anything kind of like production or uh, post-production related. Uh, one of the things, ah, here we go. Perfect. One thing I can mention is how do I how do I look at a script and what notes do I take? Um, so here's what I, if you remember in the the documentary I said we had a bunch of voiceover scenes. So you know here's here's our voiceover. I I did some takes and Polly did some takes and basically what we did is I say T one. So this is the first take. And basically I started reading this and I got to about here and I just completely flubbed my line and did something wrong, had to start over again. So I backed up a couple of sentences, didn't did take two, didn't get any further. And then, so I said, fine, I'll just start here. And that's take three. And I kind of went through that whole process until I got to take six, which again is indicated here. And I got all the way through on one take. So um, something like that. I got through halfway through and then seven overlap, but anyways, what this tells me is I've got seven takes. It looks like actually none of them go all the way through. Uh, but if I want this first half, I've got a good take of the first half and I've got a good take of the second half. So I can, which bits and pieces do I need to put together? Um, it's kind of my notes that are taken here. Uh, it's really, really great. If somebody can be taking notes like this during, um, during filming. So take one, it got this and do some sort of marking that it got this far through the scene uh, before somebody called cut. Um, or maybe put some notes on the side, take one, made it all the way through. Um, but, you know, so-and-so forgot a line, stumbled and then kept going. You know, things like that are very helpful to the editor so that you can move, you, you can um, analyze what takes are most useful first. So once you've split them up, you know which takes are actually helpful. Um, and I think that's about all that's really, um, 
yeah, I think that that probably covers it enough. Um, so, anyways. Well, thank you so much, sure. Adrian. Absolutely. That was a lot of really good information, um, especially for me. I'm a makerspace librarian, and so I actually have the creative suite in the makerspace. Unfortunately, not able to be used by the public right at this moment, but we do have a lot of this type of software um, on our Apple computer in the uh, makerspace here at the Rawlings Library. So for next year, if you guys are looking for yeah. some film editing software, I know a place. Uh, <laughs> And that, okay, so that actually, that's an excellent point. If you're going to be using like a remote, you can rent, you know, either at a library or other places, having stuff organized well before you come in is becomes extra important. And one of the things I completely forgot to mention is um, you kind of saw how I structured my project, like with all the folders. If you look hmm. on the hard drive of my computer, it's, it's exactly the same. So if yeah. you can do that before you sit down on editing, you just import that into your system. You know, that'll mm. save you some time as well. Right. Well, and, you know, with a 48-hour film festival, you know, we're really wanting to have um, some of the more amateur filmmakers have this be a first foray into um, videography, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really important to note is that you don't always get to use the computer when you want to use the computer <laughs> if you're using the library's um, services. So make sure that you know that it's coming and you've structured your time, talked to me, and made sure that you have time booked to use whatever, you know, equipment that we have that you might need to use. Um, yeah, so for the future reference, definitely always check out your local library if you don't want to spend the money to get mm -hmm. Premiere Pro for your own computer. Um, and I think that's it. I still haven't seen any comments, but we've had some folks attending and watching. So if they have any other questions, I'm sure that we can forward them on to you via email and you can sure. let us know. We can respond on the question comment. So there's you can really respond with a question at any time as you watch this video, not at, not just live. Um, so I'm just going to do just a little brief announcement. Adrian, if you need to go, you are more than welcome to. I'll just need some announcements for the rest of the film festival. Thank you so much for attending and have a great night. All right. As Adrian is getting ready to hit the road, I will remind you that our thematic elements reveal party is on Friday. It is on Friday at 630 um, it is not on the library Facebook page, or not on the library Facebook page, but it is on the 48 Hour Film Festival Facebook page. Um, so make sure that you've liked that so that you're able to um, get those thematic elements as soon as they're revealed, because once they're revealed, you've got 48 hours to get your film done. Um, so with that, uh, the deadline to get your film to us here at the library is um, October 25th. Uh, you can submit that to filmfestival at pueblolibrary.org. Um, we prefer a Vimeo or a YouTube file for that. Um, and then the judges will go over all of the information, all the videos that we have gotten as submissions. Uh, at that time, you can also vote for People's Choice Awards. So even if you didn't submit a film, please definitely check them out. Um, and our uh, winners will be announced on the 30th. Very, very important um, to remind all of you that you can make an amazing film with these thematic elements, but it is only six minutes and 30 seconds long. Any longer than that, it will not do. Make sure it's six minutes and 30 seconds or less. All right, I think that's all I have for this evening. Thank you guys very much for tuning in and listening to Adrian uh, Montgomery. And we really hope to see a lot of awesome film entries. So yeah, tune in on the 25th at 6.30 on the 48 Hour Film Festival. That's all I have for tonight, guys. Have a great evening. Bye.